Alive, you are live. Good morning, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the cool and chilly sunrise safari. Uh, it's 17 degrees centigrade, which is 63 degrees Fahrenheit out here. And I'm fairly certain, look, I'm not complaining, it's wonderful to have this nice cool drop in temperature, but I'm fairly certain that this is the coldest I have ever been in midsummer in the low felt. What extraordinary weather that we've been experiencing. But welcome to a beautiful, crisp, clear morning on Juma and Arethusa game reserves within the Sabi Sands, the Greater National, no, Greater Kruger National Park area of South Africa. For those of you joining us for the first time, my name is Jamie and I have Tebs on camera with me this morning. Out and about, trying to get out on foot will be Scott along with Viam. What an extraordinary looking morning it is. Absolutely stunning. The sun is coming up. And as Rich Levy commented a little bit earlier, when the hyena calls of the night are replaced by the Franklin's chirping in the morning, you know that it's time for your first game drive of the day. Let's look at that. Incredible. Absolutely beautiful. And don't forget that we are interactive. So on this gorgeous morning, you can send through your questions on hashtag Safari Live on Twitter, or you can email through to questions at wildearth.tv. We absolutely love hearing from you, so get those questions and comments rolling. What an extraordinary morning. This is definitely my favorite time to be out in the bush. The mysteries of the night are just waiting to be revealed with the first light of dawn. Go and see what we can find. I drove past, it was dark when I first set out this morning on our drive, but I drove past what looked to be a brand new zebra calf. And we might have had a new arrival at some point during the evening. Well, also, depending on how the morning goes, pop in for a quick visit to the hyena den just to see how all the little hyenas are faring they've been up to during the night. Lots of hyena traps around the camp where everybody lives last night. So they were out and about exploring and up to mischief. And Lucy, I know that you fed us lots and lots of updates from the activity at the Juma Dam camera last night. So Lucy who's watching in South Bend, Indiana. Thank you very much for all of your updates. I know that you heard hyenas calling. They were very vocal last night. It started yesterday afternoon, actually, when we popped in to say hello at the hyena den. And the matriarch set off doing that low, beautiful, whooping contact call that makes hyenas so famous. Oops, found a branch. Georgie, thank you for your welcome back. It's nice to be out and about yesterday after my very thorough sleeping in yesterday morning. Stop this new baby, or if this is the stallions that were following behind them. Just turn my lights off. It's still very, very dark. Obviously, we can't spotlight them. Being diurnal or daytime animals. I want to disturb them in any way. Morning, Zebs. Where's your little baby? I know I saw one earlier. But Georgie, you mentioned that that beautiful sunrise reminds you of the Lion King. Absolutely. It's so picturesque, it hardly seems real. You can hear the hornbills in the background making sounds very similar to the zebra's own call. Something that many people on their first time safaris tend to get a little bit confused by. 
They think that they're hearing zebra calling. Morning, guys. I think this is the stallion herd that we were watching yesterday. I seem to have a, a zebra attraction over the last few days. It feels as though every time I go around a corner, there's another herd of zebra, which I'm not complaining about. They are wonderful animals. On a mission. <laughs> Definitely the stallion herd. <laughs> we spoke about Rich Levi's call of the Franklin. Oh, looks like this entire family in front of me spent the night in the road. It seems like a silly place to be. I'm sitting, it's very dark, but they were all already almost the size of their parents. These are actually young Franklin. But Rich, there you go. Now all we need them to do is call. And we know that we've started at the right time. And John, <laughs> I know that you suggested that maybe we should open a tin of cat food and tap the tin. Maybe we can bring some of the lions onto the property. You never know, John, they might already be here, just waiting for us to find. Perhaps these Franklin even know where they are. And go and explore, double check and see if we can find them. Yesterday we were trying to track the wonderful Queen of Juma. Perhaps I should carry catnip on the car. <laughs> Crashing across in front. Yes, I think maybe some catnip sprayed on the tires. that trainee guides often get confused. You'd be surprised at how similar the two calls can actually be. Well, it's wonderful to say good morning to you all, and I know that Scott is waiting on quarantine for his chance to say good morning. Hello, everyone. And we are out on the quarantine clearings and really looking forward to this morning's bushwalk. It may be a lot of your first bushwalk on Safari Live. I know it hasn't been in action. It's incredibly complicated, obviously, getting all of these feeds to you, especially from a bushwalk. Like I say, VM, who's on camera with me, has got a backpack on with all kinds of equipment strapped to it, a long antenna pole sticking up as well. And we're going to continue heading off. We had some wildebeest, they have run off, and that's the important first lesson for all of you who are on your first bushwalk. It's a completely different experience to being in the vehicle and the animals will treat us very, very differently to how they treat us in the vehicles. They're gonna be a lot more nervous of us and it's gonna be difficult for us to get as close to them as we do in the vehicles. But there's different animals like the bugs and the insect, the tracks on the ground and so much other stuff that we can show you that is difficult to show from the vehicle. So they really do complement one another. Let's carry on. They really do complement one another well. And let's just hope all the work that Eugene, our tech wizard, who's on the ground now is done, is going to keep working. Because as I say, this backpack was causing a little bit of trouble. That's why we haven't been doing bushwalks for a while. You may be wondering what's in my hand. And it's a very important safety tool. It's a sock that is filled with campfire ash and as I do this you'll see that it helps tell us which way the wind's blowing. Now even though it's a very still morning the wind's blowing slightly from my left to my right which is going to be very useful when trying to avoid animals or if we do get up close and personal with an animal like an elephant or something slightly dangerous we will be at least prepared 
and know which way the wind's blowing. Their senses are far greater than ours, and we always need to remember that. <laughs> morning, Donna. Yes, I did get my coffee this morning. Thank you very much. And she's referring to a couple of mornings back. I actually had the morning off, so I just headed out on tracking team. And because I didn't need coffee as much as Brent and Jamie did, who were going to be presenting, I followed up on reports of Tingana, a big male leopard that had been seen at the Juma waterhole. And we got lucky, we managed to find him, hold the sighting until Brent arrived after his coffee, and then some of you guys got spoilt with a great, great sighting of that male leopard. He nearly caught some Inyala and really enjoyed watching the highlights of him stalking up to them. Now this morning, because it is only getting light a little bit later on and sunrise is probably only at about 20 past five, in about five minutes or so, uh, VM and myself had to kind of hang back a little bit. We didn't want to be walking around in the dark. Again, it's a completely different experience being on foot to being in a vehicle. And when you can't see and you're walking around, it is a recipe for a disaster. So we're going to be on high alert, but be, be calm. We know what to look for, the dangerous signs. And even if we do get into the unfortunate situation where an animal may feel threatened by us, and therefore act accordingly. It may feel like it needs to charge or attack. Usually they flee though, nine times out of ten. So even though animals may get a little bit scared if we bump into them, most of the time they aren't going to cause any trouble with us. And out of all of the years that I've been walking in various parts of Africa, I've never had any serious trouble. Now, Georgia, you've just asked which kind of tree was directly behind me. And it may be quite a long way behind me at the moment, Georgie. But what we're going to do is we're going to start with the one immediately behind us, which is a silver cluster leaf. And these are little baby silver cluster leaves, actually. Um, so that's a baby. And the leaves aren't looking incredibly silvery, although the underside does. Um, but I feel as these trees mature into the big ones like there is one behind us, the leaves do tend to become more silver. So that's what it's going to grow into one day. Incredible. This is a fine specimen of a silver cluster leaf. They don't all grow this big. Sadly, I'm too short to grab one of the leaves, but they do have a very silver appearance and usually are a little bit smaller than that in this area. And that's the most fascinating thing about trees. You could drive 50 miles north of here or south of here, and you may find the trees already over such a small distance, either are much larger or much smaller. So climate plays a big role. Obviously, soil type is also very important. But I love the way you can get really different sized and shaped trees that are exactly the same, but depending on the area that you're in. This is an old marula and its skeleton is slowly falling apart and the insects I guess will be to thank for that slowly breaking it down and being able to recycle it back into the nutrient cycle now Jamie knows where we are and she's just said that there's a ground hornbill flying in our general direction and VM spotted an elephant behind us that's awesome. And I'm just taking a look in the direction that Jamie is. She's at Galago Shortcut, which is kind of north and slightly east of us. I'm not too concerned about the elephants. It's a way off behind us. And I'm guessing it's probably going to cross the road shortly. So VM's just zooming in now. And in a second, you should get a visual. There we go. Yay. Isn't that awesome? And who knows, maybe that elephant's already picked up our scents. Our wind is blowing very gently towards them. And like I said earlier, the animal senses are just so much better than ours. I think he's a bull and he could well be feeding on the marula fruits that are falling from all of the marula trees here on quarantine clearings. 
Let's see if we can get a little bit closer. <laughs> Morning, Meredith. And I appreciate your humor. Meredith was obviously on the Sunrise Safari yesterday when I was rummaging through a pile of elephant dung hoping to find marula nuts that I could then open up and feed on. Let's go down here, Viem, and we might be able to get a little bit closer to him. He was moving quickly to rush to another marula tree and now he's busy feeding on the fruit. So I just want to show you that quickly. And he's just up ahead there underneath the marula tree and difficult to see from this angle but he is feeding on the marula fruits. So let's see if we can try and sneak up to him, or even better than that, try and forecast which tree he's gonna to go to next and kind of wait in that area. Yay! He's gonna be so preoccupied with his breakfast that we may be able to get really close to him. So come along. And Meredith, sorry Meredith, Meredith was just saying that I'm obviously getting excited because now I can go and rummage through this elephant's tongue in search of the delicious marula nut. Now, when approaching dangerous animals like this or being in the area with them, we're going to have to keep very alert and also just make sure that we don't become so preoccupied on this animal and forget that there are other animals out here. So I know where he is now, and now I'm just scanning around, just making sure we don't stumble into any other dangers. Again, I'm also gonna continue to check the wind, which is not doing too much at the moment, but this ash is so fine that it tells me exactly where it's blowing, and I think it's gonna be in our favor shortly. This is so exciting. And I can't believe what a luck it is that we're getting off to a start with an elephant bull. It's one of the best animals to approach, I find. And let's just have another quick look at him. And it looks like he's going to come straight towards us. There's another marula tree here. Come on, Vim, I just want to get into a good space. Sorry to whip you around but I just want to rather get into a better spot. And I know you had a good view of him briefly there, but we need to be ready for some even closer views. And that's why I want to try and get into a good spot where we can maybe sit and hide and he could come and feed and walk past us without even knowing that we're here. So I'm trying to use whatever little bits of cover we can to stay hidden. And I think we're just going to bunker down here for the time being. Be with you. Hello, TB Stain. And let's just wait here for a while and see where he goes next. TB Stain, you would like to know why this elephant is alone. You've heard that they usually move in groups or herds. And you're right, they do, but that's the females. Males will happily move on their own. Look at him smelling the air. So that could be that he smelt us. Yeah, I'm fairly certain that was our scent that he picked up. Now he continues to test the air, but it could have been our scent from earlier that slowly wafted across to him on this very still morning. Now elephant's eyesight isn't the best. And in this low light, and considering the cover we've been using, he doesn't know where we are in terms of sight, but he kind of knows some things up. But because there are these tasty marula fruits around, it's difficult to know exactly what his behavior is indicating. When we initially saw him and he was moving at quite a speed, I thought that, you know, maybe he had already caught our wind, but then I realized that it was the marula fruits that was causing him to move so quickly. And even though he's got a bit of an idea that we're here now, that's not necessarily a bad thing because then he'll be more ready for us when he does in fact find out that we're here. And it is our aim not to let animals know that we are in fit. Their ideal sighting when he's moving off, so let's carry on. The ideal sighting 
when being on foot is to be able to approach animals and leave them without even knowing you're there. Obviously that can be a little bit tricky, easier said than done, but our intention is not to disturb them or bother them, but simply to view them from a different angle. Here's some old Eli dung. Small one, I think a bull of that size would have dropped a bolus about twice the size of this. And you can see how some termites are now beginning to break it down. You can see a few little holes. The termites are obviously asleep. Let's carry on before that elephant disappears. Hello, B. Wilson. And very, very happy to hear that you're enjoying the bushwalk. And B. Wilson's just mentioned that most of the time it's the smaller critters that we view on bushwalk, and that's true. And he's really enjoying the fact that now we are viewing one of the largest critters we get out here because it is a gamble being on bushwalk and usually you don't get the best views of the larger animals but when you do it's often the, the most memorable experiences are the ones that are had on foot certainly for me getting up close and personal with some of the bigger and more dangerous animals of Africa gets the heart beating and of course leave some wonderful memories. Hello Ray Seacrest in Indiana and you would like to know how old will this elephant be and Probably around 15 to 20 years of age would be my guess, but they're incredibly difficult animals to age. And one of the major reasons for that is that they are territorial. So this elephant could have been born hundreds of miles away from here, and therefore it's difficult to keep track of the animals as we do keep track of the leopard and the lion, who are territorial, and sometimes we know very accurately almost to the day when they could have been born. Elephants, not as easy to monitor. He's just up ahead of us, probably about, at about 10 o'clock, and he's found another grove of marulas that he started feeding on. <laughs> Hello, PK in Iowa, and he is asking if I don't use a golf ball washer to clean the marula fruits before I feed on them. PK, to be honest, I didn't use anything to clean the marula fruit, but the nut was concealed within the actual seed and therefore unaffected by the elephant's digestive juices. And I just made sure not to touch the nut or seed with my dirty fingers and just use my knife to get the nut into my mouth eventually. Not easy to open the marula seeds. I think we're going to get some great silhouette views of this elephant. He's just up ahead of us now. But let's wait and see. Hello Donna, and you've asked a good question because I have been harping on about how the animal senses are so good. You are interested to know whether we use unscented soap. And I never have Donna. I know some people do, but I don't really see the point in it because I believe that the animals will be able to smell us as humans. That different scent that we give off, regardless of whether we've got soap on or not, or a soapy smell or not. Okay, this is going to be good. We've got a lot of cover here. The wind is really in our favor now. And let's just give you a quick glimpse of where the Ellie is now. It's just up through that gap. And you'll see him silhouetted there now. Again, under a mula tree, 
feeding on the fruits one at a time, but let's get a little bit closer. Again, the wind is in our favor. You can see it's blowing straight towards you. This is perfect. Lucy and you would like to know how much weight is VM carrying around in this backpack and it's probably about 20 pounds maybe a little bit more than that and there's all kinds of different equipment I don't even know what the stuff's called really that helps get the live feed out in my backpack CBS Johnson there's a first aid kit and a few other little bits and pieces, some toilet paper, always good to have in case of an emergency. This is going to be awesome. We're just going to creep down here and watch him slowly feeding on the marula fruits. He's got absolutely no idea we're here. And this is exactly the situation we want to be on. Just watching a beautiful wild animal on foot. We're probably about 60 meters away, so not very close at all. But because there's not much cover between here and there, and because this is the best kind of position I think we can get into with the wind at the moment, or the very slight breeze rather, let's just stay here and not force it. Absolutely awesome, mate. Eh? You usually just feed on one fruit at a time, and it's about the size of a golf ball. And they'll maybe give it kind of one chew just before they swallow it, but they hardly digest the fruits before they defecate them back out. They often come out looking just the way that they went in. But it's the very nutritious juices from this fruit and looks like he's going out into a nice little gap now where again we'll be able to see some wonderful silhouettes. So he's popping one fruit into his mouth at a time. Now bear in mind everyone, Vim is free holding the camera with the backpack on. He's on his knees now. So the fact that he's giving you such a stable picture is really impressive. 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 You can even see the hair on his lip. But just to remember, he is free-handing, so if there are one or two wobbles, I'm sure you'll all forgive him. Look at this. Absolutely beautiful. Okay, we're going to shoot you across to Jamie quickly. I said that the mysteries of the night are just waiting to be revealed in the morning. And I would say it's safe to assume that the hyenas had a very large meal at some point yesterday evening. Just look at that belly that's on Corky. Sure. Engorging yourself, girl. She looks like she swallowed a beach ball. But she's waddling like it as well. Good morning. You're off again to eat some more. Old injuries still visible from that scrap that happened at some point over the last two weeks with that one subordinate hyena. Oh, Corky was out and about. She was suckling one of the December twins. The other one was playing with June. And November was around as well. There's no sign of the matriarch at the den. She's probably still wherever they are, or wherever they found that particular kill feeding. We've still got a bit of a view of November there. He is watching her departure intently, waiting for her own mother to come back, maybe provide her with some food. Hiding there behind the Tamburti branch. 
Hey, little girl, or boy, whatever you may be. I'm not sure where June went. I'm going to go forward fractionally just to see who's playing about with one of the December twins. That is smelly. My oh, goodness me. They've definitely brought back the scent of the kill with them. Hey, Tibbs. Wow. That is very pungent. Hey, you smelly things. Getting braver and braver now. There was a time when we were first watching November where it wouldn't go anywhere away from the den entrance if mom was not there to protect it. Now bold and full of curiosity. Let's be careful though. It's a little bit too far for you to be wondering. You naughty thing. What are you exploring? Oh, you're going very far. <laughs> just shot out of view. Moved right around the northern section of the den into some very dense vegetation. Could be following or playing with June. That might have been where June went to. But, oh, that's a little bit far for a hyena cub to be wondering. And we've spoken yesterday about, oh, there we go. That's who you've been after. There you go. Another rotund belly coming through, carrying something. Oh, good morning, pretty. That's why November was rushing off. Mommy's home. Mommy's got something that November wants. And there's now going to be a tantrum. <laughs> Looks like, I think it's bottom part of a hoof. Pretty's been accompanied by the matriarch as well. She's going to enter the scene soon. Here she comes. Now, this could be interesting. <laughs> Whatever mommy has, November really wants. <laughs> Give it to me. Give it to me. I want it. <laughs> Can hear her whining. Look at that. It's like a toddler. <laughs> Not sure exactly what that is. It is some part of whatever they were munching on last night. <laughs> you can see how much November is dying for it. And that's out of curiosity more than anything else. Because at this stage, she's too young to eat meat. She might nibble on it out of curiosity. And of course, if you read any book, they will say that spotted hyenas never bring food back to the den. That's definitely not the case at this particular den site. Look at it. I want it. Even the sub-adult has a rotund belly. <laughs> Watching the goings on. Kimmy Ann, you said that you always thought before we spent this amount of time with him that I... <laughs> Look at that determination. I want it. I know what that is. I'm fairly certain but that is a piece of hippo skin. And the reason I'm saying that is because, first of all, it looks very fatty, but also apparently one of the hippos in Torchwood has died. I'm not sure exactly how. Look at this. A tug of war between mom and child. A determination there. I want it. But yes. Spending a little bit of time with spot hyenas, they do have a terrible, fearsome reputation as dirty, thieving scavengers, but it's totally unfair. They act as any wild animal acts on pure instinct. 
governed by different rules. But when you watch scenes like this, with the forbearing mother providing entertainment <laughs> for her youngster, you can't help but feel a certain fascination and affection for them. <laughs> not having it. Mom does not want to give it to you. You didn't say please. This is such a battle of wills here. You can see how precocious hyena cubs really are. Oh, sorry, November. Not to be deterred. Back again. Oh, come on, Mommy. You've got a full round belly. I'm sure you could spare your precocious youngster a toy to play with and to chew on. <laughs> Begging sounds. This den is providing some fascinating scenes, but Scott has managed to get a little... <laughs> That's a tantrum and a half. <laughs> you can hear it squealing. It's managed to get the, the PCI one. Oh, don't go that way. You're going to have it stolen. <laughs> and while November disappears into the den site, and pretty sees off Bella. Scott has managed to creep closer to the elephant in the morning light, so let's go and have a quick look. Well, we are gonna get some great views now. Take a closer look as he feeds. We've managed to creep into a little gap. As you can tell, he's still got no idea that we're here. And that's exactly how we wanna keep the situation. Viam and myself have been sneaking around like naughty schoolboys, trying to get into the right spot. And we've got lucky again. The weather has just provided us with the perfect, very slight breeze to work with. And it sounds like you guys have been getting spoiled with an incredible sighting across at the hyena den. Great action so far on this sunrise safari. And as you can see, the sun is beginning to bathe the low faults of South Africa with a glorious golden glow. Now, Rosanna asks a good question and I should have actually run through this earlier. Rosanna, I hope all is well in New Zealand. If this elephant was to charge or if any animal really was to charge, what I would do is I'd stand my ground possibly shout and scream at it, wave my arms in the air, and maybe even throw my ash bag as a last ditch attempt to, to prevent the animal from coming any closer. And usually that works. And let's take a closer look now as he has turned broadside to us. And the reason why standing your ground so often works is the simple psychological warfare that you're having. And even though elephants are much bigger than us, we're getting some great images now, I'm sure. Even though the elephant is much bigger than us, much more powerful than us, by standing our ground, it's going to make any animal think twice. Elephants, lion, leopard. When I say any animal, I need to rephrase that. Animals like buffalo and hippo will probably not take heed of you standing your ground, and it's going to be better to try and scramble up a tree. But an elephant bull, with all the experience I've had, oh, it looks like he's going to start multitasking. Oh. No, I think he changed his mind. I thought he was going to go to the toilet there for a moment as he began to erect his tail. But yes, standing your ground is your best option. You cannot outrun any animals out here. And thankfully it is just myself and Viam on the walk. Obviously if you're on a walk with a lot more people and guests, it can be a lot more tricky to control everyone's behaviour. But because it's just the two of us, I'm very confident we don't have anything to worry about here. Look at this golden sun on his tusks now. Beautiful.
Wow, there's people watching on opposite ends of the planet. Now we're chatting with Blair in Canada. And Blair's heard that the marula fruits will only ripen when they're on the ground. And that is correct. You usually don't see them yellow when they're up in the tree. They drop when they're kind of greeny yellow color and then become full yellow on the ground. And that is when they're ripe. Elephants will feed on them before they are at that yellow stage and especially now because it is early on in the marula season They're not going to be hugely fussy But as the weeks unfold and towards the kind of end of January last year That's when the marula fruits were really at full in full swing and herds of elephant were literally running through this clearing Trying to feed look at this. It doesn't get any better. Can you believe the views we're getting? absolutely awesome We've been following him before the sun was even up, and now we are enjoying the benefits of the effect of the sun. Oh, he may have just detected something a little bit there, but no, it looks like he's calmed down again. And I'm just going to recheck the wind. It is still in our favor, but you need to be very careful that the wind doesn't change and give away your position. But for now, we are safe, he's got no idea we're here, and we're gonna stay with him for as long as we can, but you guys are gonna be heading back to the hyena den to see what's going on with all the action over there. And what an awesome start to the morning. Look who's come out to say hello. <laughs> Good morning, little munchkins. That one's got scars all over its back. We thought we saw that earlier or when they first started appearing. It's the first time I've been able to see clearly those bald patches and scars across the back of one of the matriarch's twins. The matriarch at this point has now got to the port point where she's almost wider than she is tall. She's so full of food. Now come to call her babies out and that's the vocalizations you can hear Bella investigating on the left and Bella for those of you who don't know the little sub adult that's on the left is the previous cub of this large hyena this large female on the right so has only just been usurped by the presence of two new siblings but he's up and looking having lost whatever it was that she'd brought back to the den. They're both on alert, and I think they're on alert because June's coming down with... June's managed to get hold of whatever it was that they brought back. Got a mouthful of something. We saw November have a bit of a tantrum there when mom wouldn't pass on the piece of beet. And I said that at this point, it's far too young to be munching on them. But Barbara, you would like to know how close November is to eating an all meat diet. What's fascinating about hyenas is their extended period of lactation. June's desperately trying to escape the attentions of Bella and the cubs. You know, everybody wants a piece of whatever that is. But it's, as I said, more out of curiosity than anything else. So hyenas can lactate for up to a year and a half. They will still suckle their cubs. That doesn't always happen. And it also depends on the rank of the female. It is really interesting to observe. So usually the matriarchs are capable, because they get better access to food, they're actually capable of lactating for longer. That being said, this hasn't been the case with Bella and her new cubs. She's had her new cubs less than a, a year. Sorry, guys, I just need to go on the Game Drive channel quickly. Morning, no updates apart from Misikai on the road active, and there's one, my daughter in love on quarantine. A 
Okay, copy that. Awesome. Um, when I'm finished up here, then I'll head in that direction. It's wonderful to spend a little bit of time with these hyenas in the morning light. I was busy answering Barbara's question, and just to finish off, what they'll start to do is that at about six months old, they'll start to nibble on the carcasses. As I said, they, in general, are not thought to bring back kills to the den, but I've seen these hyenas do it on a very regular basis. So at about six months old, they'll start to nibble on meat and will be fully weaned at least by a year and a half, or at the most by a year and a half, can be younger. And for example, for Bella now, there is no way mom will let her suckle. And Gerard, as we look at that enormous belly that the matriarch is packing, and in fact all of the individuals are packing, she is positively rotund. But, like all predators, that's the way that they're adapted to be. And that digestive system happens to work incredibly quickly. Essentially it makes sense to gorge while you have the option. Eat as much food as you can before there's a risk of somebody stealing your food away from you. So all of the predators gobble down as much as they can. But yes, their digestive system works incredibly quickly. And in about two days or so, depending on if they continue to feed and depending on the size of that carcass that they've been eating, she'll probably have be back to her normal size in about two days. It's fascinating to watch. <laughs> it does produce a lot of heat though so often you notice animals with bellies like that panting not just because their lungs are restricted shame and i don't know it's probably too anthropomorphic but there's definitely something miserable about bella's body language there brazos um, yak like all of us, you are wondering about whether or not June looks as though he's eaten or she's eaten. And for those of you who haven't been watching, it's been quite a while since we've seen the sub-adult's mother. Not the sub-adult we're looking at at the moment, but the one that was running around with a piece of a kill. And no, in answer to your question, it doesn't look as though she's eaten. To me, it doesn't look like she's full-bellied. Come on, little ones, be brave. Oh. That's not one of her cubs. That's a December cub, I think. Oh. I mentioned that all predators will act according to instinct, and what that means is for these tiny little hyena cubs, the, there is always the threat of attack from either another predator, possibly even a large eagle, and maybe even snakes. And Oside PVP, I think is a name that's unfamiliar to me, so welcome to the Sunrise Safari. You were wondering why they live in a hole. Well, as it happens, it's the way that the hyenas have evolved to keep their youngsters safe. So within this termite mound, there are tunnels and the entrance to the big or the big entrances to the tunnels could maybe fit one of the adults we've seen some of them move into it but just beyond that there are tiny little tunnels that only the cubs can fit into they've essentially excavated themselves and made little shelves that they can sleep on and what that means is that it keeps them safe from other predators there's very little that's actually going to actively try and dig them out highly unusual sometimes lions are recorded as having a go at it they might pour away at the soil for a little bit before losing interest and moving on but in the depths of that termite mound is the best place for the babies to remain safe and so far when we've observed this clan and since i started working here in july we've seen three sets of babies around june when i started and then there's new three sets of cubs and all of them have survived to the six month point, which is where the risk starts to increase because the cubs start to move away from the den. 
So it's a really, really good way of keeping everybody safe, or all the cubs safe. <laughs> Somebody playing King of the Castle. Oh, November, you're getting so brave. <laughs> Now going to investigate poor June and being carefully watched by Bella. And Bob Spooner, just as finishing off the discussion of the safety of the den, you were wondering what natural predators there are for hyenas. And the answer is mainly lions. Lions are the top of the predator hierarchy out here. They are bigger and stronger and essentially dominant in terms of all of the different animals that we see. That being said, hyenas also sometimes have conflict with wild dogs, and depending on how many wild dogs there are, there's a chance that the wild dogs could win and act as a natural predator for them. So yes, Bob, it is, those are the two main threats. A leopard is unlikely to be able to take on a hyena, but with any predator, the young of any predator are at risk and vulnerable and any other predator will try and kill them as a way of reducing competition for themselves in the future and also for their offspring in the future. Now it's been wonderful to... Wild dogs! That's incredible! Just as we were talking about it. This is about to get incredibly interesting. Can you hear the madam growling? This is amazing. They've walked, they've walked straight past. They completely ignored them. Where did these wild dogs come from? That was unexpected. And they're sniffing around. The other hyenas are moving in. Pretty's moving to the side of the matriarch. They're watching very carefully, they're growling but they haven't moved from their post. The pups have all disappeared into the den and the wild dogs have gone straight past. That was incredible, that was totally unexpected. That is so interesting. And off they go. Guys, we're gonna, I think we're gonna stay with the wild dogs. We know how fast they move, but the hyenas are all safe and accounted for. Only three of them that I saw there. That was so interesting. Straight past, you can see the hyenas are so unsettled, moving away. And now Pretty going with us to investigate to make sure that the wild dogs are moving away from their den. Wow! Now that is why these live safaris are incredible. That was so unexpected. Okay, here we go. And the pace of the morning just changed. Pretty's moving out to, or outside of the den, but she hasn't gone after them. That was absolutely fascinating. Just as we were talking about natural predators for hyenas, wild dogs showed up. How incredibly well timed was that? But I think because there were three adults, I'm not sure if it's the investing pack or what's happening. It's impossible for me to be able to tell.
amazing how the pace of the morning completely changes. I don't know if you could hear it, but the matriarch is making this low rumbling sound. The base of her chest. It's actually not considered to be growling. I actually need to just stop and listen. I want to see if I can hear anything. So that sound that they make is not actually growling, it's a, but it's something similar. There's a nyala off to the left there. Wild dogs, where did you go? That's incredible. They've just absolutely vanished. What I'm going to do is, I think I'm going to send you back across to Scott while I look for them. It just means that I can concentrate a little bit better. But I'll catch up with you really shortly. Well, can you believe your luck? Sitting at a high in a den with an already incredible sighting and then three wild dog appear. What's really interesting is their behavior and the hyena's reaction to them coming. Sounds like very, very fortunate that you guys got to witness that and now let's hope that Jamie has some luck relocating them. There is a chance that VM and I might hurry on back to camp. We're not too far away, probably just about a four or five minute walk jump in a vehicle and assist her in trying to find that pack but we'll just see how it goes that is an option though we've repositioned we've come up to a big termite mount that i'm sitting on and in case he feeds closer towards us at least we'll have a high point to get to but he's still under the same marula just casually enjoying his breakfast sometimes they'll put two of those little fruits into their mouth at a time but usually it's just one at a time plopping them in and what would be nice to see is if we find some of his dung, which we could well do, they usually defecate about every half an hour to 40 minutes, which makes sense because they are feeding permanently throughout the day almost, and therefore toilet breaks are fairly regular. And if we were to look through one of his big piles of dung, we would find a lot of marula fruits. Now, the wind has been swirling and looks like it may just be blowing the odd little waft of our scent towards him and that's why I think he may have lifted up his trunk there just to try and test the air imagine having a nose like that that you could point in whichever direction you desire and just turning off my game drive radio, those are the beeps you can hear. You may have heard Jamie's voice coming through faintly over there. And she's just letting all the guys know on the game drive channel what's going on. To be in North Carolina, the least of my concerns is the wild dog. So we don't have to worry about them. And interestingly enough, cheetah and wild dog are two predators that will pose almost zero threat to humans, especially wild animals. If they are captive, that can be different. But wild, wild dogs and cheetah, as they should be, are going to 99% of the time run away from us. And I've actually never heard of any attacks of people from those animals in the wild. Elephants and buffalo, rhino and hippo, are actually some of the most dangerous of the animals out here. So it's not really the carnivores that I personally worry about too much in this area but mainly the herbivores and the number one on the list would probably be buffalo cape buffalo the old bulls they've got terrible uh, terribly short fuses and are very very aggressive to us oh look at that beautiful um they can be very aggressive to us as can female elephants with their babies but an elephant bull it's not too much of a concern for me at this stage and we really don't have to worry about those wild dogs. If anything, I was just telling VM, imagine if we get lucky and they make a kill nearby and we can film it from on foot from ground, ground level, from a low angle, it'll be absolutely incredible. And they're not too far from us, or at least the hyena den where Jamie is, in terms of wild dogs and how quickly they can move, it's probably only about a minute away in terms of wild dogs moving quickly if they came straight in this direction. And the quarantine clearings is certainly an area that is frequented by this pack. It sounds like it's the Investec pack. 
because of the fact that there's three adults, there should be 11 pups somewhere nearby. And we haven't got wild dog on foot yet, so that would be a first. Got a leopard not too long ago during Big Cat Week. That was epic. Quite a few elephants and buffalo. Okay, I'm testing the air again. But wild dog we've yet to get. Look at the sun on him. This is just too good to be true. Hello, Lynn, in Canada. And you've noticed a few things about my anatomy as well as the elephants. We'll focus on the elephant though, and you can see, you've seen that its hips are kind of poking out a little bit depending on how he's positioned, as well as his spine. And you're wondering if this is a result of the drought. I think certainly it has got, or started to take an impact on animals and their condition, but most of the time, elephant spines will protrude actually, and it's not uncommon to see their hips as well. Having said that though, of course, they're not nearly as plump as they would be if it was a bountiful summer. And I was actually looking through some footage last night of my final drive at the end of January last year. It was only supposed to be a three month project for those of you that are new and it's been extended all the way until now. So a year longer than expected, which is really awesome. But this time last year, the quarantine clearings where this elephant standing had a thick carpets of lush green vegetation, and there was a lot more food around. So that gives you an idea of the, 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 the level of this drought. But Lin, I don't think he has anything to worry about just yet. It was a very, sh I, I've just heard a very strange noise behind me. Vim, you heard that, hey? And I've, complete, I've taken my earpiece out so that I can listen carefully. Only having one ear can be a little bit detrimental when being on the bushwalk, so in times like this, it could have been another elephant or a herd of elephants. It was kind of like a shriek of sorts, and it came from somewhere behind us there. You can see probably the bush bry, some stony structures there. Tvim just showed you. Um, that was the direction that the sound came in. But as you can see, the bush is very thick behind us. We're on the fringe of the quarantine clearings. I've got my earpiece back and it didn't sound too close. And there was no further audio, but a very strange noise was made. Let's see what may happen is the elephant may put his head against this marula tr tree and actually shake it to try and get more fruits to drop down and if that happens it will be absolutely awesome. Wicked Blues Band, good to have you with us and no the elephant can't hear us talking it's got no idea we are here. If it could hear us it would certainly react to our presence and I've got a little microphone right below my chin and even though it may sound like I'm talking loudly I'm not I'm whispering and this elephant let me assure you has got absolutely no clue that we are here if it did it wouldn't be acting like this and like I said earlier at the beginning of the bushwalk elephants and all of the animals here will react entirely different to us when we're on foot they will be a lot less tolerance of us and either run away or run towards us to chase us off. So those are kind of the two reactions that you get when on foot once an animal has detected you, most of the time. So it looks like he's moved away from the base of the marula tree there, but that is something that you will see. Maybe not today, but in the coming weeks you'll get to see the elephants shaking the marula trees. And imagine, I mean, that is a massive, massive tree. Imagine the strength they have to be able to move it even just slightly enough to get the fruits to drop. Ah, 
good question from Amber, who's watching in Washington, D.C. And she's wondering if she ever comes out to Arethusa or Juma for a holiday, would they be able to go on a bushwalk with their guides? And the answer to that is yes. Um, depending on your group, you may even be able to do a full uh, walk in the morning instead of going on a drive. But what most camps do is that after your morning drive, they take you for a short walk. Um, obviously a great way to immerse yourself on foot. Um, but if I could choose and if I could suggest anything, I would suggest trying to go on a work walk first thing in the morning for the duration of what would have been your drive. To go out afterwards, especially in summer, during the heat of the day, is not going to be very pleasant. In winter it's possible. There you can do your morning drive and do a long walk in between drives. It all depends on your guide though and the camp you're staying at. Uh, the flexibility of both guide and camp does vary depending on where you're staying. And again, it's important to remember that depending on how many other guests are on your vehicle or who you teamed up with, you may need to all kind of clan together in the decisions being made for what you're going to do. Therefore, it is possible to rent your own private vehicle at a lot of the camps you can go to, and that way you decide what you and your guide will be doing with either you and your partner, you alone, or your group, depending. So, worth looking into, and I would suggest just clearing that up with the camp before you get there, just so that they know your intentions. Oh, oh, I... I was hoping that the Ellie was going to push his head against the tree there. It looked like he was for a moment. Okay, now it sounds like we may have to rush back to camp, jump in the vehicle and give Jamie a hand with the wild dogs, but we're going to send you across to her vehicle for an update. Hasn't it been an incredible morning with this bull so far? Anyway, we're probably going to leave him now and we'll catch up with you a little bit later, maybe in the vehicle. dashed off to. Their tracks are everywhere close to the dam though, which is where I think they've come from. Now, Ephraim said that he saw a pack of wild dogs last night coming across onto Juma, or coming towards Juma, and he said it was a big pack. It wasn't the investor pack, so this could well be the Sands pack that's actually decided to pay us a visit. Too soon to tell, really. I'm just coming to check Gauri cut line to see if they've gone back towards their youngsters. And once Scott is out and bound, then I'm going to ask him to go and check the Galago pan so that we split up our directions. But yes, keep an eye on the Dreamer Dam camera as well. They could well pop out there. I'm going to a little bit of a signal dip so I might disappear or stutter for a moment but I don't want to send you back over to Scott because he's on his way to back to camp so bear with me Detroit Shell is one of the viewers who's put in an enormous 
enormous amount of effort into identifying individual hyenas. You said maybe the wild dogs followed the scent of that hippo meat. Could well be. Um, they are naturally very curious creatures. So that could be one of the aspects. I think they were following the scent of the hyena den. It was so smelly there this morning that Tibbs and myself could smell it, even with our puny senses of smell. You can be sure the wild dogs did as well, but then this is also the way that wild dogs move. So they course through the bush without really necessarily having, well, that we understand, a plan in mind. They seem to just go straight, regardless of what's in their way. And then I think probably the smell, once they started moving past there, the smell attracted them to it. And thanks to the zoomy that is double checking from the Juma Dam camera to make sure it's great to have you playing along with us and working with us to help relocate these wild dogs. It means that we don't have to worry too much about keeping an eye on that particular angle. I just cannot believe how fast they disappeared. Unbelievable. Natasha, absolutely, they vanished. It's like they've got some kind of mysterious portal that they stepped into because we went from seeing them to not seeing them in a split second, and that is how wild dogs work. That's why I tried to leave the den as quickly as possible once I'd made sure that all of the hyenas were present and accounted for. But they still managed to give me the slip. We spoke a bit about natural enemies of hyenas, but the point that we didn't really cover thoroughly, because we got interrupted by wild dogs at the hyena den, which is still something I'm trying to get over. I love these live safaris. But yes, Natasha, you're right. To an extent, predators will go out of their way to avoid conflict. And that's because, obviously, injury out here, disadvantage, being a weaker link, means that you've got a much higher, in or much increase start again, try that sentence again. A much higher chance of actually being killed. You don't want to have any kind of weakness out in this harsh, harsh environment. So predators do go out of their way to avoid conflict. But with spotted hyenas, it's also a numbers game. So wild dogs and spotted hyenas, they will go for each other, as you saw with that interaction with Scott a couple of weeks ago, where the adults of the Sands Pack managed to isolate one individual hyena, get it away from the other one that was in the sighting, and proceeded to attack it fairly savagely. So with wild dogs, it's a numbers game, and that, I think, is why those wild dogs ran straight past. They were not unaware of the hyenas, but what was so interesting is that they barely gave them a second glance. They tossed it through, but they didn't even look up. Or barely did at any rate. And that to me is so, so interesting. Where on earth did you go? I know that you've either, even if it's the investing or the sands pack, we know they've got pups somewhere. We didn't see the pups come through. And that, I think, is also a survival tactic. The pups know when to stay out of trouble. And that's also what suggests to me that those wild dogs knew that that hyena den was there. And if it is the investic pack, then they've actually been scouting this area for a while. I mean, we know that they were around that particular water Galago pan and this drainage line system. Kind of look for tracks at the same time. especially with three sets of young cubs, could well start to become too much. And that's one of the reasons why we spend as much time as we can with them during the times when we do know where their active den sites are. Sorry, guys. Oh, 
last station from Billy Poligny. dogs have disappeared off in a flash of white wagging tails, you're wondering how much ground they will cover in the course of a day or in a hunt. And the answer is huge amounts of area. That's why, as a species, wild dogs need such enormous amounts of space. So they can easily cover 25 kilometers a day, which is about... Sorry, I'm just double-checking as I go around this corner is about close to 12, 13 miles. And in a hunt, they can chase the animal down. The thing is, they're so fast that quite often the hunts that we've, successful hunts that we've witnessed have been over in a matter of seconds. But they do have the stamina to hunt down and to wear down an animal that they are after. I'm just wondering if they didn't change direction and come this way. On average, from what I understand, wild dogs can have home ranges of easily 22,000 hectares. That's 22,000 soccer fields and about a third of the size of the Sabi Sands. I'm sure you're wondering when Scott's going to be on the road. He wants to just give you a quick update on to his, as to his progress. We'll be back shortly. Okay, so we're just arriving back at the DRC. This will probably be the most some of you have ever seen of it. This is the entrance. This is where the vehicles live. That's where the humans live. We're going to jump into Rusty, get the vehicle, get the camera on, and be out with Jamie searching for these wild dogs. Hopefully it won't take us too long. We'll see you guys shortly. A quick behind-the-scenes scenes tour of our lives at Juma. Scotty there. We're still busy on our Ferrari safari trying to figure out. See, I think I can smell them. Either they started here or they're still around. Wild dogs carry a very, very distinctive scent. Um, very much like a dirty dog. They quite, I've quite often found them by smell first and then started looking around for them, especially in, time, in times where I don't expect to see them. What, what an unexpected turn to the morning. Who would have thought that we would be sitting at the hyena den and the wild dogs came racing through? Make life in the bush so unexpected and so exciting. I know that our regular viewers are very familiar with the fact that things can change so fast out here. There you go. Gotcha. Hello, munchkins. What you been up to, pups? <laughs> Yeah, stations have relocated these Madutch on the short, uh, just to the north of Galago Pan. Awesome. Hello, pups. Right, I wonder who we've got here. They've got something. They've been on a kill. What you got there? Piece of meat. <laughs> One of them's got a patch of a tuft of grass coming through. Hello. <laughs> Hi. Yeah, how cool is that? So close to the car, completely comfortable with us. Dashing about with what is just a patch of grass. <laughs> Playing a game of catch. So, so cool. Now tug of war. Hello, 
Hello, it's Steve and Jenny. Steve and Jenny, we watch in France. It's been a while since I've heard from you guys. Um, glad you're back on board with us. And you were wondering what the story is behind the Investic pack name. Investic is a financial institution in South Africa, and from what I understand, they sponsor the research that's being done. Look at this. <laughs> Stalemate. One of the pups coming to investigate. A little female by the looks of it. And now tugging away. The one on the left is slightly bigger. Sorry, Steve and Jenny. It's, as far as I understand, yes, they sponsor the research into these wild dogs. There's a lot of wonderful organizations that help to safeguard them. Oh, coming in, three-way tug of war. Bull, bull. <laughs> like puppies. That's a very, very good point. I'm just going to turn on the virtual reality rig. I hope we can capture this in a 360 degree view. So that's what the beeping's going to be about. <laughs> that's the ball of GoPros. What you up to, guys? Where are your parents? I wonder which pack this is. Oh, the incredible thing about being surrounded by wild dog pups like this is that you get to enjoy the most fantastic interaction and watch that loyalty and the social bonds that they all demonstrate. It's fascinating to see. Now I'm gonna hazard a, hazard a guess here. And I'm gonna say that this is the Sands pack. Now the reason I'm mentioning that, and I'm gonna shift around so that you have a better view, since they seem to be settling in that corner. The reason I'm saying that is because these pups are mostly females. Now, as you know, I don't know the exact counts of the Investic Pack pups. Hello, you coming up to say hello? So cool. Curiosity. Those big radar ears giving us a good solid look. One of the Pops all around, so fascinating. I drove this road first thing this morning. <laughs> Having a pee in the road. But yes, I was saying, I think this might be the Sands Pack. And the reason that I say that is because there's more female pups in this group than I've seen in the Investic group. I haven't got an exact breakdown for the Investic pups, but I s suggested that it was somewhere in the region of about nine males to two females. Either way, I've seen at least four females wandering around with this particular group of pups. I would not be surprised. I could, of course, be completely wrong. You never know. This is one of the male pups. Nice full belly. So they've munched on something. While we were sitting at the hyena den, their parents had already killed and eaten something. What a treat this morning has been. Excitement from the beginning. See that white flash of the tail. That one of the adults has also now made an appearance at the back right there. Oh, awesome news is that Scott is on his way, so we'll be able to make sure we don't lose them. This block is famous for scuppering the efforts of all kinds of presenters, whether it's looking for Karula or finding wild dogs. <laughs> this block is built from dense vegetation. Okay, we can move forward a little bit now. Didn't want to scare any of the pups. Oh, quick link to Scott, who has one of the adults. Well, this is one adult who's obviously been hunting and he's making his way back to you and Jamie at the Gallagher Waterhole. We're in the vehicle and we have joined in the wild dog.
chaos with you guys. Hold on tight. I'm not too sure. We're not too far away from the link road to the Gallagher waterhole where that wild dog is heading back to. So we'll be with Jamie in that area shortly. Well, well done to Jamie for finding them again. That's awesome stuff. And now that we've got two vehicles in the area, there's a much greater likelihood that we're going to be able to keep with them, leapfrogging ahead as they move at incredible speeds through Juma. But Jamie's in a better position now, so we're going to send you back to her. Just shifted up ever so slightly to get closer to the resting pile of puppies lying in the shade at the back here. And they've already had a very, very busy morning, that we can guarantee. But they're up and starting to move, it looks like in Scott's direction. And now the games begin <laughs> as they start to move into this dense, dense block. a group so we can figure out who they are, if it's the Investic pack or if it's the Sands pack. And the pups lingering behind there. She stopped to, oh, there's one coming up towards us from the right as well. I love watching them move. That agility is just incredible. Ooh, smelly creatures. why they are one of the most incredible animals to watch and, and it sounds as though they're on their way to Scott let's pop over to him so welcome back we've got a few members of the pack running straight towards us now and I wonder who it is it's so difficult to tell the pups of the Investec pack are getting quite big now so hard to say what's what but i think you know, it looks like it's mainly pups and just three adults that i can see so far what we need to look out for is one of the big males who's got very distinctive distinctive notches in his ear or ears so that will be a good sign to tell us whether it's the sands pack or the investic pack but i'm guessing it's the investic pack of three adults and 11 pups there's Jamie, and at this stage, um, we can only both really head towards Gallagher Shortcut. It's a tricky area for both of us to, to work with the pack for now, but definitely worthwhile that we are both here because, as you've seen, they change direction and move at great speeds. Okay. in Detroit at the moment we're probably only about 400 meters away from the hyena den quarter of a mile um, but we are moving slowly away from it so I'm just gonna let Jamie know that I've done quite a big loop ahead Jamie I've looped all the way around onto Gallagher shortcut not just to let you know I'm trying to keep visual from my side as long as I can. Uh, Jamie's done the exactly um, correct she thing. She has stayed with them for as long as possible. She probably just intuitively worked out what I was doing. And she's kept an eye on them for as long as possible, as you may have heard. Copy. Thanks, Jamie. Forgot to acknowledge her radio comes there. And they are heading towards us. I'm guessing they're going to pop out somewhere here. But to off-road for them in this area will be very very tricky so i think we just need to be patient here they come here they come they're in here and they're moving kind of parallel to the road for now somewhere off in here i did get a glimpse of one yeah i'm living with a feeling wicked blues and we would like to know what would happen if the Sands Pack and the Investic Pack bumped into one another? It's a great question, especially because we're not sure which pack we are with at the moment. Um, Wicked Blues, I'm sure the Investic Pack would 
quite easily overpower and chase the Investec pack away. The reason for that is that there's 10 or 11 adults within the Sands pack. Sorry, I think I said Investec pack twice there. There's one adult that's running through you somewhere. There you, there you go. Well done, VM. Yeah, I'm only in. You've got me like a dead and wobble. But they're kind of sniffing around a bit. Um, backwards and forwards. So difficult to forecast what we should do now. Wicked Blues Band, apologies for not focusing entirely on your question there. With all this excitement, I'm trying to obviously think about what to do as well as to answer your question. But wild dogs will fight. Like most predators that aren't from the same pride or group, there's massive competition between them. But I've never actually seen a skirmish between wild dogs. Looks like the rest are slowly approaching this individual. You'll start seeing a few more shapes. I wonder if they've had a successful morning hunting. It doesn't look like it. there would be a reddish tinge around their mouths and necks. So that's good prospects for us. We could get lucky and see them continue to search for a meal. And we do have visual of them coming straight towards us, I'm not too sure where Jamie's going to go, but she can do whatever she... So it sounds like she's gonna do a massive loop round, which is a good call. I'm just getting relayed info from Nikki in the final control. And yeah, they seem to be gathering a little bit more momentum. Kevin Catfish, you've made an observation that Peter is not in his pan, the hippo Peter. It appears like there could be two Peters, Kevin, as I'm sure you are aware. We saw two hippos in this area, or in the area of the pan, just a couple of days back. So that's also important to remember. It's not just one hippo that's lurking around, Juma. It's two, and you'd like to know what would happen if this pack came across him. Probably not too much, Kevin. He would... They would probably maybe give a little bit of interest to it. Maybe he would run off, nervous of them, but he's far too big a prey item for them to take seriously. And if anything, it would just be the pups playing around. So I don't think we'd... Uh-oh. You wouldn't believe it. Jamie's found the rest of the pack and it seems to be the Sands pack. Awesome. There we go. How incredible is that? We were right about it being the Sands Pack. This is the rest of the adults moving through on their way to where Scott is now. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them that were split off from the main group of pups. Now the Sands Pack at last count for our, from our side numbered about 21 dogs. As far as I know, 10 of those were pups. The rest of them are adults. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> All that racing around has put dust on my nose. I'm going to try and stay with them so that we can see the, um, the moment where they reunite with the rest of the pack. Right, the wild dogs do have these Mickey Mouse type ears. They're on earth, they're moving so fast. They've tried to, I think we're gonna have to go around to where Scott is. And Sir Richard, yes, absolutely, they can hear incredibly far. It's a way of being able to locate the other members of the group as well as to hear or to hear prey that might have been spooked by their crazy chase through. 
Now, I'm not sure of the exact distance that they're able to hear, but obviously those ears are a huge amplifying system and a way of being able to detect the calls through the bush. So I would hazard a guess and say that they could hear easily around five or six kilometers, if not more so, depending on the contact calls that they're listening to. them here, running up a long road. Where'd they go, Tess? There we go. They are, they're searching, they're searching for each other. There's one individual, there's the rest of the adults coming through. Well done, Tebs. So yes, they're making their way to where Scott is. We might even, if we're really lucky, get to hear those contact calls that I was chatting about. You can see the way they're ranging, looking for the rest of the group. They're gonna be approaching Scott fairly soon. So yes, about four or five kilometers that they can hear, apparently. Uh, I slightly overestimated, but not by much. You can see the way they're searching. And as they disappear towards the rest of the pack, let's go over to Scott, who's got the rest of them in the road. Well, isn't this absolutely incredible? Wild dogs everywhere. This one's running right up to us. And I'm battling to tell who's who. This one's head, I don't know if you'll be able to see it. It's literally right here. And they're sniffing very, very intently. Who knows what it is that they're smelling or that's preoccupying them so much, but isn't it fascinating that they just carry on about their business as if we are not even here within a meter of our vehicle. Now, I take back what I said earlier. Look at this one's belly. Almost wobbling from side to side. It's definitely eaten. Who knows, maybe they had a very big meal late last night, or maybe they've already fed early this morning but they do look quite well fed. There's some playing in front of us now. And let's see what they get up to next. They're such playful animals and moving incredibly quick. And I'm thinking that these are the pups. They just seem too flawless and not quite big enough to be adults. But it is difficult to tell and if they are pups, I think that they would have been born slightly before the pups of the Investec pack, because the Investec pack pups do seem a little bit smaller. It's a little bit easier to distinguish between the pups of the Investec pack, as I've said, compared to the Sands pack. So, I don't know what you guys think, but VM, do you agree? A little bit easier, hey, to distinguish between the, the, the pups of the Investec pack and their adults relative to these. Ah, Carol Christie, you ask a question that I cannot answer, but it's nice for us to just think about at least. You'd like to know who would win in the battle between the wild dog and the hyena if the wild dog came across them at the den. It's six of one and half a dozen of the other, Christy. And it's a guess similar to saying who would win a sports game between two different teams or who would win a boxing match between two different competitors. It is impossible to tell until, of, of course, the event unfolds. But let's kind of try and break it down a little bit. There's a lot of adult wild dogs in this pack. And I have seen this pack teaching a hyena a very, very important lesson. And I thought the hyena was actually going to be killed by this pack. It was in a sorry state. And even though wild dog are a lot smaller than hyena, if the numbers outbalance or outweigh their competitors, small opponents can often win. So, it could go either way, and there's quite a few adults within that clan of hyenas, so maybe it would be them that win now. 
It looks like the pack are heading back towards Vuyatilla Access. I think Jamie will still be there. Let me just check in with her. Hey, Jamie, are you still on Vuyatilla Access? Yeah, I'm just about to pop out there. Um, the rest of the adults should be coming out any moment. Okay, copy. I'm just approaching the old hyena den access, but it looks like they may actually be heading back towards Muyatella access from here. Okay, copy. So... It appears like quite a few members of the pack are moving through this block to the west, which is in the direction of where Jamie is. And Jamie did have seven adults which were moving towards us, according to Jamie. So it could be that the pack are going to meet in between the block. Yeah, I'll start on the uh, power lines now with the rest of the pack. And Jamie, as you've just heard on the radio, has got the rest of the pack, so we're going to send you across to her. Oh, this is fascinating. We've got one, two, three, four, five, sorry, six. Six adults here. Sorry, guys, someone's just trying to get hold of me on the Game Drive channel. Ah, Scott's got it. I'm sorting that out. So the rest of the pack is here. We've been watching them. Scott and myself have been watching them search for each other. The adults are desperately trying to reunite with the rest of the pack. But what I don't understand is why they haven't contact called yet. A little bit closer. Wanting to know because this is such a big pack, how big a wild dog pack can get before they start to disperse. And Rianne, duck my head down so that you can have a look at what's happening here. Rianne, I've heard of wild dogs growing up to 40 individuals before, but as far as I know, that's the exception rather than the rule, and that they will start to disperse at around 15, 20. Sorry, guys, hold on a moment. Oh, okay. Luckily, Scott's got it again for me. Sniffing around. I wonder if this is where they made the kill. And they've moved close, they moved closer towards Gallagher for water. This is definitely the adults. Three, four, five, six of them. Now, I wonder when these pups are going to start making their way through. And Donna, you're absolutely right. The Investic pack only has three adults within it. You're wondering how many the Sands pack has. And I have to confess, Donna, I think that it's 11, or it was 11, and that it was 10 pups. I think originally it was 11 pups, but one of them died. But Donna, I think that is roughly the number. It's either 10 or 11. And I've only ever seen them when they've been rushing about like mad things, as they so often do. So I sometimes I'm unsure as to... I've never managed to get a proper count of them. <clears throat> They're such awesome animals. James, you have a very valid point in terms of the numbers of the pack and the prey selection. So yes, bigger or larger dog packs would be capable of taking down larger prey. That being said, as a general overall statistic, regardless of the size of the pack, about close to 80% of their kills within the Kruger Park, so it's very area dependent, just in the same way the pack size is area dependent. About 80% of their kills are in parlor, regardless of whether or not the pack is large or small. But for a pack like this, they could easily target Nyala. Um, they tend not to go much bigger than that, but there are always exceptions to the rule. And of course, the most efficient hunters out here. 
so interesting watching their body language. They're searching. There we go. Here come the rest of them. At the back there. Come on, guys. Come say hello. Cautious approach. Oh, you can hear them whining in happiness. Here they come. This is going to be amazing. Listen to this. Puppy-like excitement. They're all dashing all over the place and greeting each other so happily. You can see the joy in them in terms of being reunited with the rest of the pack. Oh, I was going to move, but I don't need to because they're coming back to us. All racing around, tails up in the air. Sheer joy at being reunited and this is why wild dogs are such special animals these bonds between family members are so so well reinforced a pack that rules itself not like hyenas through aggression but through subservience and begging that's what makes them so special here they come dashing along And we're surrounded by wild dogs. Racing through. Can hear the feet thudding. Here they come, here come the rest of them. <laughs> and Keith, we've mentioned that they haven't been making much of a sound. Oh, here they go, this is gonna be amazing again. <laughs> to Scott now, he might have a better view. <laughs> I'm going to send you over to Scott to have a look from his perspective. Wow, isn't this just fascinating? They are incredibly intent on reaffirming their bonds, making sure that everyone knows that everyone's one another's best friend and this is a great example of just how intense the bonds are within a pack of wild dogs. And when there's this many of them, the sound and excitement is just almost too much to take in. Fascinating stuff. We've got Ephraim who's just joined us here in the sighting. I'm just gonna reposition and maybe Allow them. We're going to send you back to Jamie. We're still surrounded by the pack. They're moving all over the place like crazy things. Dashing about and playing. The pups reuniting with the adults. And you could just see it in their body language how joyful they are at being reunited. So special to see. That is what we get really excited about. This is why Scott and myself split up for this moment of the reunion, which is the best part of sitting with wild dogs, to watch that interaction happen. Safari Dean, absolutely. It doesn't really get better than this, does it? Hyenas, wild dogs, wild dogs crashing the hyenas' dens party. Pups everywhere. And getting to watch the comparison and the differences between the two most social of the predators out here, 
and the ones with the most interesting social structures. And so different from each other, the hyenas and the wild dogs. Hello, little girl. You're beautiful. And this little, this little pup is absolutely extraordinarily beautiful. Here come the rest of them. There's going to be another mass greeting involved. <laughs> All the adults racing across. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but there's still little happy squeaking sounds that they make. They are such wonderful animals. The athletes of the bush built like streamlined, powerful hunters. And I know that many of you, it's difficult to get a bit of a scale, although now that with Scott back there, you can have a bit of an idea of exactly how big the dogs are in comparison. So let's pop over to Scott and have a look at things from his perspective. Now, I think a lot of what's going on here is actually not only greetings, but there's also a lot of begging going on between the pups and the adults, and the pups are hoping to try and urge the adults to regurgitate some of the meat from a kill I'm guessing they made this morning. And it's interesting, some members of the pack are certainly more full-bellied than others, there's some great views of Jamie now and Tebs with all of the pack around them. So let's make the most of that. Take some screenshots. Jamie and Tebs are going to love that. Look at this. Big smile on Jamie's face. As you can see, it's also heating up and that's why she's taking off her gear. Good. Well, that was awesome. Okay, well, it looks like the pack may well start to move now <clears throat> after all of their greetings. And <clears throat> we're going to send you across to Jamie in third. Vehicle has just joined, we're a fourth vehicle. So we're going to lurk back and help as a vehicle to help relocate these animals and leave Jamie with the wild dog and the two other vehicles here. head down so that you can have a look and see what's happening here. I'm not actually sure if Scott got around to chatting about the size of the wild dogs or not. I know that we did have a question about it. So it's difficult to get a sense of scale, but the pups are quite a lot smaller than the adults still. But Coast for Bernie, you want to know roughly how big they are. And yes, you're about right with your Border Collie comparison. Border Collies are a bit fluffier but they are much smaller than German Shepherds. Here they come back again. You can see that greeting again. <laughs> I love it. It's like they haven't seen each other in ages, not just a few seconds. This is what makes wild dogs so cool. Now, I, they are definitely begging the adults for access to food. You know how the adults regurgitate. And Kim B, you were wondering if the adults are feeding the pups. Well, they would have definitely munched on something at some point. And as we saw with the Investec pack a couple of weeks ago, oh, there's just wild dogs everywhere. <laughs> I barely know where to look. As we saw, not a couple of weeks ago, a couple of days ago with Scott, the Investec pups are already making kills on their own. But the best part about the wild dog dynamics is the fact that the pups always come first. So within their social structure itself, they're walking right around the bonnet. This is awesome to see. They've all moved across in front of us. And yes, the pups always take preference at kills. They'll have first access to the food there. And then even more incredibly, if they approach one of the adults and beg sufficiently well, they will cause the adults to regurgitate and provide them with an extra portion of the meal. 
it's that selflessness that makes wild dogs such a special, special social creature. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Paul Rizzo, absolutely. They do sound like dolphins. <laughs> that squeaking that they make. And there's more coming around to the left of us as we speak. Jenny M, you were wondering if they make sounds that we can't hear in order to locate each other. Let's go around so we can see them properly. And Jenny, absolutely, I would not be surprised if that was the case. Sitting around on our left hand side. walking right in front of our bonnet. Now, I'm busy talking to the rig at the same time so that we can have a full 360 experience. Now, keep looking across to your left. They're all around us at the moment. Some of them are walking directly in front of the bonnet, almost underneath the car itself. Oh, <laughs> we have been so incredibly lucky with wild dogs. And Billy Belanger, you were wondering why the wild dogs love Juma so much. And we'd never know that they were endangered, the number of incredible sightings we've had. Please don't jinx us. We'd like to spend as much time as possible with them. And we've been so fortunate because it's only after the wild dog pups came out of the den that we were able to see sightings like this. But I think what we've been really lucky about is we've fallen right in the sort of overlay between the home ranges of both the Investic and the Sands pack. And because their pups are now old enough to run around, they're covering enormous distances. We've just so happened that a lot of time has been spent on Juma itself. We've got to spend as much time. And of course, that question raises a very interesting point is that you are looking at one of the most endangered predators, one of the most endangered creatures we have on Juma. And yes, we've seen them fairly regularly, but these 21 dogs that you've been watching this morning are 21 out of only somewhere in the region of about 194 to 197 in the Kruger National Park area. There are less than 500 of these magical creatures in South Africa. And this Kruger National Park population is one of the only viable populations within South Africa itself. And 20% of the total population of wild dogs are apparently found around Tanzania and those sorts of areas. All moving right around us. There's more coming across from our right, settling down in the shade of the termite mound. And the adults definitely are, some of them are covered in blood. They have blood on their faces, so they've munched on something. Hello, guys. And you're looking essentially, for those of you who've chatted and love of grey wolves, and we spoke about them yesterday, you're essentially looking at the African equivalent of a wolf pack. And sitting so close to them, I can actually hear them breathing. I can hear them panting. Keith, absolutely. Days like today, make this job not just wonderful but extraordinary to experience moments like this it doesn't really get much more exciting than wild dogs running through a hyena den and then reuniting themselves with the rest of their pups it is just the most phenomenal experience and keith you want to do this job well i would strongly encourage it i think that between tevs and myself we might have two of the best jobs in the entire world Long days, early mornings, and moments like this that are beyond words at times. 
experiences that can't even be described. Cool. Look, they're lying in the shade of that vehicle, having a sniff around the tires. Just imagine what it's like to be one of the guests on the back there and have such a close experience with the wild dogs. <laughs> Using the shade of the vehicle to rest up after their morning activities. Oh, sharp canine teeth. You can see why they are such amazing predators. <laughs> Check this curiosity of the one on the left. It's almost going to go underneath the car. Having a really good sniff. There's something fascinating on there. <laughs> and I actually really enjoy moments like that because it comforts me in the knowledge that we're not having any kind of negative impact on them in moments like this. And in fact, we might even be contributing to their entertainment value for such brilliantly smart and coordinated predators. The curiosity means that they need to constantly be looking and sniffing and exploring new things. For those of you with dogs like collies or vimaranas or pointers you'll know exactly that kind of hunting dog style of thinking very busy all the time that's what makes wild dogs so special Awesome, awesome stuff. Up again. And that is one of my favorite aspects of the wild dogs dynamic. I said that they are bound by ties of loyalty. And early, you were wondering whether because most predators will leave an injured pack member or an injured pride member behind, they don't really show any kinds of um, loyalty in that respect. You were wondering if wild dogs would actually come back to help injured pack members. And yes, I've even heard stories of three-legged and two-legged in one particular case, pack members surviving purely due to the generosity of the pack itself. They really, in that respect, they are one of the most special creatures out here. They're bound by complete and utter selflessness. I wonder what they're up to. The whole pack is on the move. Some slower than others. South Africa. And what I mean by that is they are capable of managing themselves and dispersing in a way that therefore doesn't cause any breeding. And Chris, you were wondering if that ever does become an issue. 
Now, for most of the wild dog populations within South Africa, with, the, with these packs being the exception, there is actually the potential for inbreeding. And most of the packs are in smaller private reserves, fenced reserves, which is great for them. It means they're protected. It means that we're slowly starting to bring them back to their original distribution range. But on the other hand, it means that they have to be managed. And they really do have to be managed. They can't disperse on their own because obviously they come then in closed systems. You can see how surrounded we are by wild dogs all moving across in the front of our vehicle. And Chris, absolutely, they have to be managed in a certain way. So that means that human beings will have to dart them, bring in different populations, bring in new breeding opportunities in order to ensure that inbreeding like that doesn't happen. One last one running across the front of our car to catch up. I think they are going to pop out onto Voyatella main access. Shoot forward so that we can try and stay with them for as long as possible. But never fear, they... And while these, we try and stay with them from this angle, Scott's looped around and he's caught up with the adults on the road. We just had an extreme close-up view that VM was trying to show you of this wild dog's sparkly white teeth. And we're not too far from Jamie, we're probably about 200 meters away. Now it looks like these adults are all heading back to her, actually. But we're in a very good situation. She's staying on Power Lines Road, and they've kind of been moving parallel between Voyatella Access, which is <coughs> the road we are now, and that Power Lines Road. Interesting, I'm wondering what they're smelling. Is it possibly the Investec pack? Another pack of wild dogs that has been spending more time here on Juma than this pack has over the recent past. That's certainly possible, and I'm guessing that that would make the most sense. I mean, I'm not sure what other smell would cause them to really spend so much time trying to work out what's going on, other than that of another pack of wild dogs. That would be the most kind of, most concern to them, I guess, to a degree, or most interest to them. I'm just trying to work out when last the Investec pack did move through here with relation to when last it rained, because rain often washes away scents of animals. So, difficult to be certain, but really interesting behavior to see nonetheless. It looks like they're now all heading back towards the road that Jamie's on, and we're going to send you across there to see how she's coming along. The rest of them are on their way back towards us. Reposition so we can... Where are you? <laughs> Every time I pick a direction to go in, they decide to go the opposite way. Just to keep you guessing, just to keep you busy. And to keep, of course, Ted's busy as well. Here they come. All dashing about, tails in the air games happening, where are we going to end up? It's a bit of a betting game with these guys, or a guessing game maybe. They hedge your bets as to which direction they're going to go in. For now, we just content ourselves with this view as they figure out which way they're going to go. That's the way they're going to go. while we watch this pack disappear off towards Scott again, you were wondering why wild dogs are endangered. And Gary, the answer is it's one of those mysteries, not fully, completely understood. Within the Kruger itself, their life expectancy is probably about five years old. They're disappearing off now into the bushes. And I think they might pop out towards Voyatella main access there. But Gary, one of the big reasons is habitat loss. Habitat loss, 
and the fact that they do cover such enormous areas means that they need big open territories which they can't always get out here. Um, human encroachment is such that these big wide open areas like the one that we're in at the moment are not that busy. Oh, Scott's got them again on the road, let's pop over there. So we've just got into position, possibly not the best one because there's a tree in the way, but they are going to come past that shortly and come streaming past our vehicle. Awesome stuff. They've literally just popped onto the road <clears throat> and I've done a quick U-turn and here they all come. This is awesome. I see in Oklahoma, you'd like to know if they smell as bad as hyena. Well, they, their smell is actually far more pungent than that of hyena. And I don't know which is worse. Um, hyena, I guess around the den sites, it can be quite smelly. Look at how close they are to us. It's as if we're not even here. And I literally could let, be, bend over and touch one if I wanted to. I can see the blood all over one's neck underneath its ear here. This is so awesome. Can you believe it? So, Marcia, it's a good question, but what is certain is that they smell much stronger than hyena do. Usually when, oh, and I think worse, now I've just got a real deep inhale of their scent. What are you guys smelling so intently? Surely it's another pack of wild dog that's riling up all this interest in them. Listen carefully, you can actually hear them. Now, other things that they could be smelling are other predators and Kush has just asked that. What's going on here? Is that a little bit of playful discipline? Yeah, it looks like, oh, it looks like certainly one is being taught a little bit of a lesson. And it's acting very submissively now. And who knows what that was all about? Absolutely awesome. It looks like a young male. And it seems to be getting a lot of attention. Why? I'm not too sure. But the complexities of their hierarchy and their statuses is going to obviously be difficult for us as humans to read into. Unless, of course, we spend day in and day out with the pack. I'm hoping they're going to come across some potential prey because there still are a few empty bellies. Oh! <laughs> Good question through from Bob Spoon and He's interested to know if there's anything that would cause uh, a pack like this to split up. And yes, it's not uncommon for large packs like this to have members break away. It's usually kind of three to five members that may peel off a large pack and start a pack of their own or even join up with another small pack. And these are known as dispersal packs. That's the official lingo that is used. Um, but it's certain events or act that I know of that will cause them to break up, other than kind of just some feeling the need to move on. Other vehicles have now joined us, they've looped around, and the guests were very, very happy to see wild dogs. I know people that have been on safari to Africa for 10, 15, sometimes even 20 years, and have never laid eyes on these animals. Oh, 
Poof. Kay is asking a question that I'm not going to be able to answer entirely easily, and that is whether the Sands pack or the Investec pack may have come from what is called the Halftail pack. And if my memory serves me correctly, I think the Halftail pack has actually become the Sands pack. There was a member in the Sands pack with half a tail, and it is no longer. And that is why it has now become the Sands pack. I stand to be corrected, but I think that is the case. Now, it looks like they're all heading straight past Ephraim on Vertilla access towards kind of sandy patch area. So, Jamie, it would be useful for her to be in that area. I'm sure she is probably already there. And, yeah, if she comes a little bit further south, we're going to stop here and she'll get a good visual of them heading straight towards her. So over to Jamie. Here they come, here they come. They're coming straight towards us. We're in a perfect position. The whole pack running up Voyatella main access. Hello guys. <laughs> Surprise. Now yeah, they've all stopped to look at us. What an awesome view. Actually, not often that we get to see them approach like this. You can really get to see how the dynamics work. Adults trotting in the front, babies playing in the back. Here they come. up in, towards us and I know that you had them right up close with Scott earlier and Mark Rector you were wondering why it is that they never attack any of or none of the animals ever attack people on the vehicle and Mark I'm gonna address that in one moment I'm gonna try and keep my head out of the way so that we can have a look they're gonna walk right in front of us or right down to the side of us can see that tight bond. I think that is the alpha pair, actually, that I just saw go past. The closest of di di the dynamics. Pups coming up behind us. I should have done a head count while I had the opportunity, but I was so distracted by them all wandering through. And we're going to be coming up to our last few moments with them, and we're crossing towards Sigma B. So, Mark, in terms of the animals, Sorry, Mark, I just have to do one thing. I have to clap for the VR rig before I turn it off. Just allows us to sync it up when we do come towards putting the videos together for your viewing pleasure. So, Mark, the fascinating thing is that the animals become hugely accustomed to the vehicles moving through. So, Sabi Sands has been habituating animals to the presence of the vehicles for the last 40 years. And they become very, very comfortable in its presence. It's going to get very, very thick here, guys. I think if Scott could race around, maybe towards Triple M, that's where they're going to pop out. Might not be able to keep up with them through this drainage line. The other aspect is that we have never been on the menu or anything like that for animals and in fact we've always been seen as a threat. Now when you arrive at a safari lodge you're always told that the animals see you as a big unit if you're in a vehicle. They don't identify individual people. That to me is not true. Personally I think the animals are more than bright enough to recognize that there are people within the vehicle. They pick up individual shapes. The only thing, the only difference is, is that they don't feel threatened by it. As soon as you break the outline or you put your hands up or you stand up, then it becomes a different sort of reaction to the ones they're used to and that's why they run away from you if you do. It's not because they didn't realize you were a person in the car. Still with the wild dogs, they're here in front of me. It's just a matter of negotiating without smashing the virtual reality rig. 
Victims of these wild dog sightings are our poor vehicles that do a sterling job. Oh, we're coming up to Triple M now. They do a sterling job of managing to keep us going. They're coming right up to the main road. They're going to cross into Simbabili. I love wild dog mornings. Now, it's not unheard of for animals to attack people in vehicles. It does happen. Wild dogs is completely unlikely. There they go over here. They're going to cross soon. Oh, let me try and get you a last view. And there they go. Running across into Simbombi. <laughs> What an awesome morning this has been. But for those of you unfamiliar with our show, we have reached the end of our traverse area. So across there is Simba Bidi. We can't drive on that particular property. And so that is our last moment with them unless they suddenly decide to come racing back around. Whew. Mornings like that are absolutely awesome and really exciting, but also quite exhausting that maniac driving that we do through the bush trying to keep up with them imagine how fit they are just waving to some of the other guests i want to just hop onto the other channel the other game drive channel and let them know uh, what do you know sorry nikki i missed that message did you say scott has let them know sorry guys just Double checking we don't pass on the same message because there's nothing more irritating than the comms backing up. Okay. Well, that is that. Should we go back to the hyena den and see what's happening and if they've relaxed there? What an incredible morning's viewing that has been. We can wrap up this entire story, just bring it round to its final conclusion. And while I make my way there and negotiate the main road that is Triple M, let's hop over to Scott's vehicle. Well, it doesn't get much better than this morning. It's been one of those really, really memorable safaris. And very happy to hear that Jamie did a good job of staying with him right till the final moment there. Oh, this is a lucky Impala. And she's pregnant. Woo! She doesn't realize how lucky she was. Possibly peeled off from the herd in order to give birth. They do peel away. Sadly, she's disappeared into a very thick bush. So I can't show you that she's actually pregnant, but she definitely was. Joey in Australia and if you'd like to know if a pack this large would be inclined to hunt larger prey like zebra or wildebeest it definitely is possible morning Mike Good morning. and that's the camp manager of Juma Juma's camps we are telling Gallagher's husband and he's busy taking his daughter off to school um, so just saying hello to him Monkey man, yes, it is possible for wild dogs to hunt bigger prey such as wildebeest and zebra, but I've never actually seen it happening in the flesh. So most of the packs that I've seen hunting in the Savi Sands stick to smaller prey. It definitely is easier, it's less dangerous for them, and because they are such effective hunters, they don't really need to try and take down anything too big. Also, the fact that they can move so fluidly, so easily, 
means that they come across enough prey on a daily basis to be able to kind of be fussy and pick on the easier meals like dicus, skin bike, and parlor sized prey. Obviously also in Yala fall into the brackets, as a lot of you will know, they chased them in Yala into poor old VM's car, which ended up on Brent's lap. And just thankful that none of them got injured. That could have ended up badly, especially if it was a young male in Yala with horns. Anyway, monkey man, time will tell, and let's just hope that we'll get to see these dogs hunting just about anything, but it would be interesting to see them trying to take down bigger prey. to know whether wild dogs will ever be hunted by any of the big cats and yes I guess they will be hunted to a degree not for food though and all predators will only kill one another simply for competition Dory it's not to feed on the aim is the god the aim of it and the god of it is not to get a meal but it's to eliminate competition having said that though occasionally the big cats and other predators will feed on their victims so even though textbooks, at least all the textbooks may suggest that predators will not feed on other predators, I have seen that happening. I have seen leopard with wild dogs hoisted up into trees and have partially fed on them. So both leopard and lion will kill wild dog and it's one of the biggest factors that we keep harping on about that's incredible about both the sands pack and the investing pack they've been incredibly fortunate in raising so many pups this year and quite often the mortality rate is brutal and you'll lose a lot of the pups that are born to a litter and that leads to Willem's question which is just slipped my mind and I will be reminded of it shortly. Oh, and that's got to do with the demographics that we've been noticing at the moment between lions in the area. And Willem's interested to know, is it possible that we're seeing a lot more wild dogs lately because we're seeing less lion? Yes and no. I mean, it could be defaults, or it could be that the wild dog <coughs> have realized that this area is a bit of a vacuum at the moment and there's not many lions moving through it, and therefore they're enjoying the relative safety of running around in lion-free areas. It definitely is possible, but it also could be defaults. Um, people often kind of miscalculate and misassume that if lions are on Juma, all the leopards will leave. That's not the case. And I've seen leopards watching lion 100 meters away and not running off scared. They know that they can escape from lions if need be. And it's the same as applicable for wild dog. I mean, wild dog know the threats that are out there to them. And even though lion are around, they're not going to run off many miles away from them because by the time they've got many miles away from one pride, they could bump into another. So difficult one to answer conclusively, Willem. It could certainly be that they're enjoying not having lions around and therefore hanging out here longer than they normally would. But I'm not convinced that that is the case. Speaking of lions and leopards, Vian mentioned earlier that the problem with this morning is that we've been in this small area, relatively, with us on the bushwalk and Jamie only at the high in the den and now with the wild dogs, and we haven't explored the rest of Juma. So we're going to now search around for any tracks of lion and leopard. Now, Dory, just to emphasize how big cats will hunt and kill wild dogs. I had one sighting where a pack of wild dogs were chasing impala through a big open plain along the edge of an airstrip and lions were at the one end of the airstrip, wild dogs were at the other end of the impala in the middle and naturally the wild dog were chasing towards the lion. And what the lions did was they lay flat as they anticipated what was happening 
and I'm not joking, an impala literally had to jump over a lion. It ran straight past it and the lion didn't flinch and waited for the wild dog that was chasing that impala. And as the wild dog came past, boom! The wild dog was in the lion's paws. Luckily though, the wild dog played dead. And once the lion let it go and got distracted for a few seconds, the wild dog kind of opened one eye, looked up, and realized that that was the chance to make a runner. And it got up and bolted off. Obviously, maybe with a few puncture wounds from the initial catch, but it disappeared. Um, so that was a lucky one. Usually that's not the case though, sadly. Sure. Now, earlier on, we were asked what would happen in an interaction between lion and, uh, sorry, hyena and wild dogs, and I kind of wasn't too sure, but it could go either way. And Anna Marie has now just asked what would happen between wild dog and a pride of lion. Again, we would have to look into how many lions there are, but any kind of regular pride of lion, even if it's two or three or four against a very big pack of wild dogs, will probably come out on top because they are just so much bigger than wild dog. And even though wild dog may harass lion to a small degree, I don't think they're ever gonna actually make contact with them because all a lion needs to do is literally whack a wild dog with its paw and it could probably break bones. I mean, they're just so much bigger. A lioness is probably four or five times the weight of a wild dog at least. So it's not gonna be that wild dogs aim to really kill or hurt lion. They may try and kind of, like I say, terrorize them or tease them, but it's gonna be unlikely that wild dog tear into a lion, even if it's on its own and it's old and injured. It'll be interesting to, to, to know though if there has been any recorded documents of wild dogs killing lion, but I find it highly unlikely. Unless, of course, there's cubs involved. Tiny little lion cubs, that may change things. But for adults, there's gonna be no major competition. Our plans are to continue south down Zoe's Road. There was, oh, there goes a hornbill you may have just got a glimpse of. I don't know where it's flown off to. Looks like it wasn't. Looks like it was on an international flight, not a domestic flight. Going far. Um, the plans are to kind of work the southwestern corner of Juma, hoping to find some sign of Karula, a female leopard. We did have tracks of those heading down this road before heading east yesterday, so I'm just gonna snoop around and see if we don't get lucky finding her. Beautiful, beautiful day. It's turned out to be what it has been since the get-go, I guess. A few clouds out to the east than to the west. And who knows what will happen. There's still a little bit more time, still 25 minutes of safari left, so. Let's see if we can't make this an even more memorable safari with the time that remains. Bravo's yuck. Apologies if I have pronounced your name incorrectly, tricky one, but good to have you with us. And you would like to know what inspired me to, or who inspired me to become a safari guide. And I'm not too sure what it was or is that caused my love for nature and the outdoors. Neither do my parents. They 
both enjoy being out in the bush and did take me and my sister to national parks like the Kruger National Park, which we were a part of, and Kukluwe Amphalozi, which are some reserves closer to my hometown in Durban. But from a very, very young age, there was something about animals and being outdoors that just captivated me. And like I said, it's not kind of because of my parents, even though they helped allow me to explore these wonderful areas. It's not a major, major, huge passion of theirs. Um, I guess just a kind of natural inclination towards wildlife. And then, of course, I was very privileged in my upbringing, being taken to national parks and immersed in wonderful wilderness areas. The, the boarding school that I went to even had a game reserve on it. So I think it's the only school on the planet that has its own little reserve with giraffe and zebra and wildebeest running around on it. So on the weekends, we were allowed to go and explore on this wonderful estate. And even my friends at school, I kind of tended to hang out with guys that liked fishing and the outdoors. So holidays with them and their families helped me further hone my love for the bush. So no one event or person, just a kind of general flow, as I said, that allowed me to end up doing this wonderful job. And I guess that's life in general for everyone. There's so many different forks in the road, even just being back in South Africa at the right time to jump on board with Safari Live. I was technically only back here for a two month holiday um, from Kenya where I was working. And I heard about the job and ended up not going back to Kenya and I'm still here over a year down the line. So. Lots of twists and turns along the way. All right, well, I'm sure Jamie is approaching the hyena den and She's not going to be too far away from that, so it'll be interesting to see what's happening when she gets there. And you guys are going to be able to jump on board with her to see exactly what does happen. Coming up very close to the hyena den, but Scott and I had a very similar idea of maybe just spreading out a little bit before moving back, before I moved back at least, into the area that we started our morning in. I know that Scott's been discussing what inspired him in response to Brazos, Brazos Yak's question about why it was that we went into the business that we're in. And I've just, I was actually, as Nikki was letting me know what Scott was saying, I was just thinking about my own background and my own career path. And it has been the most incredible adventure. And moments like that certainly make it even more so. And I think in terms of my inspiration, it's just twofold. I grew up very much a city girl. I grew up in Johannesburg and went to school there. And I was very fortunate to have a grandfather who was incredibly passionate about the outdoors. He's a fascinating man with an incredible life story. And there's a herd of elephants over there because it's just that kind of morning. <laughs> Hello. we have a look at one of my favorite pachyderms and probably one of the animals that's been responsible for helping me choose and stay in this particular industry. My grandfather inspired it. He used to live on the coast and take me out exploring with him. And then a trip to the rhino camp in the Lapalala Waterberg area was one of the ones that I feel was absolutely pivotal in my decision. I was about eight years old and I fell in love with Rhino. And I bought my first wildlife book, or at least probably my parents bought me my first wildlife book, which was called Signs of the Wild. Beautiful, multi-purpose. Hello, girl. Shame, you guys, you're looking stressed. What's up? All secreting from their temporal glands, but body language is nice and relaxed. Luckily for us, they're going to choose whether or not to come across in our direction. 
But yes, my first book, Signs of the Wild, I had it signed by the author. And within a couple of years, I had memorized pretty much every single page. Learned all about the different antelope species. I used to test myself on it. And I think what really inspired it was this feeling that I can only describe and I still feel it to this day, now many years down the line and many years of living in the bush, that spending time out here, I feel the most myself, if that makes any sense. It feels just natural and where I'm meant to be. I've always been happiest in the wild, even as a very small child. Coming on a bush holiday, whether it was to visit the Pilansberg or the Kruger, has some of my earliest memories and most vivid childhood memories attached to it. And I think you are just born this way. All of the guides I've met are unified by this passion that we have for wildlife, great and small. For me, while rhino will always have a special part, or a very special place in my heart, it's probably where I've devoted most of my time in my career. And they were my favorite animal when I was younger. one of those incredibly special life experiences and I'm very aware of exactly how incredibly lucky I am to be in the place I am and being able to share these moments with all of you. And speaking of special moments and this incredible morning that we are experiencing, Scott has another one of our most endangered species to show you. So not easy at this very second to see clearly what we're looking at, but some of you will know that this is a rare and endangered ground hornbill. Kind of turkey-like in appearance, I guess. With those big red gular patches of skin. And it seems to be alone. So not too sure where the rest of its flock could be. They usually do travel in small family flocks. Let's see if we can't reposition and get you another view. I don't think we are going to be able to do too well and too much better than what we've done so far. It's incredibly thick. There may be a chance that you can get them through that little gap there, Vim. I've tried to stop on the right spot. He was, oh, he was somewhere. And it's difficult to tell whether they are male or female. Um, what I'll try and do is just quickly pull up some pictures of them on my bird app and show you guys a better idea of what exactly they look like. And it shouldn't take me too long. Oh, and Nikki's just made a good suggestion, and that is to make the sound of this bird, which is a wonderful, wonderful noise. Okay. So... If Beam zooms in here, it will, you'll see that it says males have red throat skin, females have a blue chin patch. So it's very difficult to see, but I'm going to scroll through. And here, oh, I can't zoom in. There should be a more zoomed in picture. So this is a male, and I think what we were looking at was a male. There's the blue throat patch of a female. But unless the angle that you're looking at them at is perfect, it's difficult to tell. I mean, obviously that could be a female from this angle, I think. So unless you're looking at them kind of head on and get a good view below their beak, difficult to be certain. Then in flight, you'll see they've got white primary feathers, but they spend the majority of their time on the ground. This one's found a frog to feed on, and they, it looks like possibly even two frogs. It's, a, it's got a two in one year. I wish I could zoom in, but there's two frogs there. Um, they also feed on snakes, baby tortoises, just about any insect that they can grab. They are very versatile hunters. And this is an immature one. They've got a very yellow coloration on their face and those gular patches. They nest in cavities in trees. And there's a tiny little chicken there, believe it or not. Not easy to see, though. And this is the reason why they do not do too well in a lot of areas. And because their nesting sites are often burnt 
in the fires and especially when a lot of uh, the conservationists believe that yearly fire burns were helping the animals, not realizing obviously that they were um, getting rid of a lot of potential nest sites for birds like this. That's why they are rare and endangered. Good one, glad we got a glimpse of it. Well, Lady Luga in Saudi Arabia. Happy that we managed to find your favorite bird on what's already been a wonderful sunrise safari. Well done to VM for spotting it. Jeffrey in Texas, thank you very much for enlightening all of us that there's actually a video out there of a leopard attacking a ground hornbill. I didn't know that such a video existed and that must make for some really interesting viewing. Thanks Jeffrey, I'll certainly try and search for that and while we continue our search for a uh, leopard who could be lurking here in the vicinity of a ground hornbill, we're going to send you back to Jamie. Well, I think I'm just going to make my way into the hyena den and wait for the leopard to come to me because that's just the spirit of the morning that we've been experiencing. No, I just want to check in with him and see if all is relaxed now after that surprising moment where they were as taken by surprise as we were. Quite an incredible thing that we experienced or moment that we all experienced this morning. You never know, this is one of Karuna's favorite areas. She could well pop out. That's the magic thing about our leopards, all of our wonderful leopards, is that you just never know when they might, or where they might emerge. Perhaps this hyena den is good luck. This goes to show, you just don't know what to expect or where to expect it. It's the second time in a week that the wild dogs have completely taken me by surprise. You'll notice I come in nice and slowly to these hyena den sightings. And that's just so that we reduce the level of impact that we have on them to see whether the adults are still around or if they've actually decided to explore the area and make sure that there's no remaining wild dogs and it looks to me as though they have left. All is quiet on the hyena den front. Cubs must all be inside, nestled safely in their protective burrows. It doesn't seem as though any of the females that we saw earlier have made their way or are still around here. And actually, in hindsight, that doesn't surprise me at all. I suspect that they've gone to patrol and investigate and make sure that there's no threats to their den. And also, by doing that, they draw any possible attention away from their den site. So by moving away, they can pull a threat away from their cubs. As you can see, all the main entrance holes, devoid of hyenas. The cubs will be safely wrapped up in the tunnels themselves. Okay, well in that case, we'll go and join Scott on his leopard search. some extraordinary situations play out both with the hyenas and the other predators but of course one of the most striking sightings that we've had or a couple of striking sightings that we have had I'm just trying to not traverse over the hyena scat that's right next to my tire because I would regret that intensely the smell would follow us forever after but yes the, some of the most incredible hyena sightings we've had recently have been internal scraps between the clan members and I suppose maybe scraps is the wrong word to describe quite serious attacks. But Kimmy Ann, you were wondering if for example a hyena died of its injuries 
perhaps the one that you saw with Scott, who was quite seriously injured. You were wondering if hyenas would eat them. And yes, they would. Hyenas are not picky. I have had camera trap pictures before in the project that I used to work on of hyenas carrying a spotted hyena carrying another spotted hyena's head. I've actually also seen pictures of a brown hyena doing the same thing. Out here, where access to food could always become scarce, you never know when your situation's going to change, hyenas have perfected the art of adaption and not being picky in terms of what they eat. So for something that might be, for us, a bit cool, a bit distasteful, doesn't apply to them. They're not governed by the same morality that we are. They do what they do in order to survive. So yes, they will. They will eat other hyenas, they will eat other carnivores. It's quite unusual. Most of the other carnivores won't eat the um, members of the other pred predator species. It's quite, it's not unheard of, but it is unusual. The only real situation is quite often with male lions when they kill another lion. They eat it as a display of dominance. You saw that occurring with the Birmingham boys as well. Now this morning, if you cast your mind back before all of the excitement, I said that I'd seen a brand new zebra foal, or a very tiny looking zebra foal. I wasn't sure if it was new or not, it's still too dark. And I think that Scott has managed to catch up with it now, so let's go and have a look. Welcome back, and this herd of zebra has just stumbled across us, or us across them. There was a little foal that it's moved off into some thick bush already, and we're just waiting for the rest of the herd to pass by us. I'm not too sure how big this herd is, or if there are some more foals in it. I heard Jamie did see a little foal earlier on this morning. Possible that it's the same one. We don't have huge, huge amounts of zebra in this area. And that one's enjoying nibbling on some grass. They typically prefer slightly shorter grass, but during the drought like this, they'll take whatever they can get. again to Amber in Washington DC and it's a great pleasure letting you know a little bit more about doing a bushwalk when you do come out on safari. You'd also like to know a little bit more about planning a safari and with regards to what time of year to come and what are the benefits of either season, will it have an impact on the animals that you see. In the Sabi Sands, um, I'm just going to stop here and here we'll be able to show you these zebra while I continue letting you know about the different seasons. In the Sabi Sands, <laughs> the only thing that the different seasons is going to have an impact on is basically your temperature. So it's going to be cooler and more pleasant, if not actually quite cold in the early mornings, as opposed to summer, which is going to be swelteringly hot. With regards to what you will see, the animals are basically the same in the Sabi Sands, or your chance of seeing all of the animals doesn't fluctuate come winter or summer. It rather fluctuates depending on your few days in summer as against a few other days in winter. So the animals won't really migrate away from here in huge numbers. Other than the birds, so there'll be less birds around, about half as many birds. But in terms of mammals, your chances of seeing good quality sightings are equal come summer or winter. It just depends on luck, really, of your few days out here. But what winter does mean, and why I prefer winter, is that the bush is more open so you can see further. It doesn't mean you're gonna find more, but it's kind of more enjoyable. And even now, the bush is far more sparse than it usually is in summer. So we're not getting a good indication of how thick it actually would be in the summer months. Usually now you wouldn't be able to see that zebra from where we're sitting, but now you currently can because the bushes are very thin. So I personally prefer winter. Um, I was leading a privately guarded safari 
I would be able to spend hours out with my guests between, or, you know, from sunrise to sunset, whereas in summer, I would not spend all day out with my guests because it would be hugely unpleasant. So the fact that you've got more time to explore also means that you could possibly see more things in the winter, but at the lodges you may be going to, that's not necessarily going to be the case. You'll probably just get your standard three hours plus minus in the morning and standard three hours plus minus in the afternoon, which again leads to the fact that you can hire a private Land Rover or hire a private guide to take you on safari at an extra fee, but there are benefits to having somebody of that nature take you around because then one can push the envelope a little bit and do more than you naturally would do. So yeah, I mean, it really comes down to the individual, but I would suggest coming in the winter months or at least the months close to Sorry. I must apologize. Sadly, we any marula nuts to feed on this morning, and I'm not sure if there's going to be enough time to, but we'll definitely try. Interestingly, I've just seen some pack tracks of the wild dog here. So this is obviously where they came into the property. They came from the south, and. Nice to know that this is where they started their morning here on Yuma. Jeffrey in Texas, Kirsty, has already found your video of the leopard attacking the ground hornbill and it sounds like it's awesome so they've got that ready for us to go and have a look at later so thank you for letting us know about that there you go a few lucky impala that vm is just panning across to see but they've disappeared there's a few of them running around wildly it might be worth seeing if we can't get you a view of them but no, it's very, very thick. You can see a bit of a blur of movement there. Well done, VM. Couldn't, couldn't resist trying to show you them. It's quite good quality when you do see them running around wildly. Well, speaking of running around wildly, it's been an incredible morning. Thank you so much for all of your contributions and for joining in. Be sure to join in for the Sunset Safari a little bit later on. Well then, VM on camera, thanks to Nikki and Kirsty in the final control. Over to Jamie. Sure. What an incredible morning that has been, or this morning has been. I have enjoyed every single moment of it. It was so exciting. And I just had a good feeling about it from the minute we set off and we had that extraordinary sunrise that we were sitting watching. But it just goes to show how many unexpected moments can unfold on one of these live safaris. And to go back to Brazos' question, it's one of my favorite things out here. First of all, you never know where your day is going to go or what to expect. But second of all, Every day brings something new. It doesn't matter if you're looking at the same animal again. That animal's gonna be doing something different. There's every single time you see a creature, and it doesn't matter if it's anything from a bird to an insect to wild dogs and hyenas coming together in that incredibly intimate surrounding. Either way, you're going to learn something incredible and new every single day. And I know that's, I'm sure, one of the big draws for our regular viewers watching these live safaris. And the incredible thing is that you get to spend more time than any other safari guests on the planet in watching and observing and learning more about the way that these animals interact. So I'm so glad that we could share that with all of you. Big thank you to Tim for doing a fantastic job of keeping up with those wild dogs bouncing around all over the place. I'm sure you'll all agree he's done a fantastic job and as well as to Scott and to Viv who managed to assist us, assist us in that particular regard. 
Thank you, Nikki, and thank you, Kirsty, the lovely ladies who direct us in FC and make crucial decisions about where to be at what particular point in time. And of course, to Eugene, who keeps the techniques running and all of our technology running smoothly. Have a wonderful day wherever you are in the world. I hope that you have a fantastic day and we will catch you for the Sunset Safari. Cheers, guys.